This is MuggleCast, the Harry Potter podcast discussing everything about J.K. Rowling's wizarding world. This week's episode is brought to you by Blue Apron. Check out this week's menu and get $30 off your first order with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash MuggleCast. And by Canvas People. Get your own 11 by 14 canvas for free. Just pay shipping by going to canvaspeople.com and using code MUGGLE. Welcome to MuggleCast episode 345. I'm Andrew. I'm Eric. I'm uh, Micah. And we are joined by a guest this week. Welcome to the show, Nikki. Hi, I'm excited to be on. It's great to have you. People will remember that your husband was on a month or two ago, Robert. Yeah, in like September or something. Okay, yeah. So this is like part two of the day's <laughs> time on MuggleCast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Muggle cast in the days, part two. Anyway, let's get your fandom ID, learn a little bit about your experience in the Harry Potter fandom. What's your favorite book and movie? Uh, my favorite book is Prisoner of Azkaban. My favorite movie, yeah. uh, I feel like this is a trap. My favorite movie watching experience and midnight premiere was obviously the sixth one where I met my husband. But uh, <laughs> you're obligated to say that. But my actual Did favorite movie. Did he say movie, that, by the way? I'm, I'm- I think, um, so that I think he did, yeah. Oh, yeah, I just wanted sure. to make sure, yeah. <laughs> but my actual favorite movie is The Sorcerer's Stone. Okay. Yeah. What's your Patronus from Pottermore? A tortoise shell cat, which at first I was kind of disappointed, but I thought about it a little more. I actually own a tortoise shell cat, and her name is Lily from oh. Lily Potter. So even though I don't think my personality is very cat-like, it's kind of a weird coincidence, so I guess I'm okay with it. Huh. I think Pottermore knew somehow. Yeah. You That'd be kind of creepy. Yeah. yeah. How how about your Hogwarts and Ilvermorny houses? I am a Ravenclaw and a Thunderbird. Nice. Nice combo. <laughs> What's your favorite birdie bot, every flavor, bean? Lemon. I like all things lemon, and I feel like it's a pretty safe choice because it doesn't look like any of the disgusting ones. So. Yeah. Yeah. Have you been to the theme parks? I have. We both... Uh, Obviously, Robert and I live in Florida in the Tampa area, so we're not far, and we have family in Orlando, so. Love it. Are you annual pass holders? Budget-wise, this time, no. <laughs> okay. So what, what's your favorite drink in the theme park? Frozen butterbeer. I wasn't a big fan of the hot butterbeer, but that's because oh, darn. Oh, it's never hot or cold enough in Florida to enjoy the hot yeah. butterbeer. Yeah. So frozen butterbeer. <laughs> yeah. The hot is a seasonal thing. To, to help that because, yeah, nobody wants that in, like, July. Yeah. And I guess the I would want it in soon. July. I'm just saying it is the tastiest, the fullest flavor. Ugh, yeah, and I mean, cleansing. it is air-conditioned in the Leaky Cauldron, the Hogshead, so, like, I know, you can drink it comfortably. It's so miserably hot sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> True. Well, yeah, there's no wrong answer. Don't worry. <laughs> What's your favorite ride over there? I actually, it was kind of bummed that they got rid of Dragon Challenge. I like roller coasters. I know, Andrew, you don't like roller coasters, but that was my favorite ride. So, oh, so you need to go and like lay some flowers at at the foot of where it once stood. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> yeah, what's, what's the status update down in Orlando with that area now that it's officially taken down, right? Yeah, um... well, they're building the new one. Have you have you been down there, Nikki, since they've closed it? I have not. We just went to the Food and Wine Festival at Disney, so we haven't made it to the Universal in a while. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Andrew, you're heading to Orlando soon, though, aren't you? Yeah, next weekend I'll be there. So, so you're we were actually it out? just there for, we were there during Food and Wine, weren't we? Uh, food and Wine was going on in Epcot, and we were at MuggleNet Live, and we actually rode Dragon Challenge. I think we were, like, one of the last groups to do it. Ugh. Jealous. Yeah, because it was closing that weekend, I think. Yeah. Otherwise, I wouldn't have ridden it because I, I do tend to get bumped around quite a lot. Mm -hmm. But yeah, RIP. And finally, Nikki, what's your favorite Harry Potter video game if you play them? I actually don't play very many video games at all, so I've never actually played any Harry Potter video games. But I do oh. have a favorite Harry Potter game. My husband just recently bought me my birthday's coming up, so he bought me the Cards Against Muggles. Oh. Uh, I don't know if you've seen it, so he actually... I guess he had to have it delivered from England somewhere, and uh, we just recently got it. And some of the cards are pretty inappropriate, more appropriate for like after dark discussion, but some of them are pretty, pretty funny. Yeah. Eric, haven't you played that before? I have. I um, actually wasn't pleased with some of the entries in that card, so I ended up 
customizing. I, I scoured the internet and BuzzFeed and a bunch of other articles for sort of like people's top best favorite ones and then made my own deck. Oh. Of uh, yeah, so I, I sort of I curated Harry you Potter. Would, I feel like that's something you would do. That is yeah. Very, oh uh... yeah, and I made them. I curated them, and I actually just put them in with my bigger blacker box of Cards Against Humanity. So now they play very well together. Yeah, I think we're gonna mix ours in with our regular Cards Against Humanity too. But there's a lot in this deck. There's like hundreds of them. It's huge. Yeah. Yeah. And mm-hmm. I found one that I thought Micah would like. It's a white card and it says what Aberforth did with that goat. Yeah. <laughs> send that to him. He can frame <laughs> it. Yeah, or if you something. can spare it, uh, send it to the PO box. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's good to have you, Nikki, and thank you for your support. Of course. We're going to have to have you talk about video games anyway, because on today's show, we learned some really interesting news about Warner Brothers' plans for Harry Potter video games going forward, including one particular game that they announced. But first, Eric, you have a P.O. Box updates. Yes. So I just wanted to mention before we go forward that we did get a – this is sort of a belated announcement. It's all on me. We got a Halloween card that I failed to mention from our good friend and listener Tatum, who says that she's been a Harry Potter fan since age 10. She's now 24 and she also threw in, in addition to a lovely little card that had like a um, sort of a pop-up candy corn kind of thing on it. Really, really nice. Really a lot of thought went into this. She also wanted to add her two cents on the Jim K. Illustrated copies. She says it's fitting that they come out in October each year, at least for me anyways, because this time of year makes me want to read Harry Potter. Mm. So I thought that was really special. And actually, the only other thing is we got two separate postcards from the British Library HP exhibition. So a couple what? weeks ago, we reviewed the book that is, you know, sort of an overview of some of the items present in the British Library Museum exhibit, but both Trudy and Ning Chi, please forgive me if I'm butchering your name, sent us the Phoenix postcard from the British Museum, which they have and 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 scrawled little notes. I'll actually take a picture and share it on our Facebook group but really nice messages. And it was so fun because they both like separately say like par avion and British library stamped on them. And it's like all really official. These came to us from the British library. So it's just so heartwarming because our listeners are, you know, listening to our show and hearing about this exhibit and then going and experiencing this exhibit and then sending us a postcard from them. That's cool. That is very cool. That's really awesome. Really, really cool. Yeah. Thank you for doing that. Yes. Thank you to everybody. So, this show, this episode, is going to primarily focus on the video game news and the new Fantastic Beasts Illustrated Edition that was released earlier this week. And we got some voicemails, we got some emails, we got some text messages, we got some quizzage, we got Nikki here. So much to do today. And let's get right into it. So, um, who here has played Pokemon Go? I'm raising my hand, but you can't see it. (laughs) I have not. Micah, I'm raising you? my hand too. I you have, are? yeah. Okay. Most people in the world, it felt like, were playing Pokemon Go last summer. It was by this developer called Niantic. And it was really cool. You could go out, you could actually leave your house and go outside <laughs> and explore outside. places. And you would encounter Pokemon in your area. You were walking through a, a, a virtual version of your area and and you could you can battle pokemon you can't trade yet which is still really annoying but you can level up your pokemon you catch rare pokemon it's sometimes hard to catch pokemon anyway it was so popular because everybody loved pokemon back when we were kids a lot of people still do love pokemon as well and there were rumors a few months after pokemon go came out uh, people were saying there should be a harry potter go this would be Mm. great we, and I think we brought it up at one point as well. We were like, there should be a Fantastic Beast Go where you can go around and catch beasts just like Pokemon. Yeah. Well, lo and behold, it, this felt surreal to me. Niantic and Warner Brothers, they have a new gaming division called Port Key Games. And they are going to develop a slew of Harry Potter video games. The first one that we know of is called Harry Potter Wizards Unite. It is developed in partnership with Niantic. And it's going to be like Pokemon Go, whereby you walk around your local area and you discover 
things. <laughs> Hogwarts <laughs> teachers, popular characters from the series, I guess beasts. We don't know too much about it yet. But here's the release from Niantic's website. It says, with Harry Potter Wizards Unite, players that have been dreaming of becoming real life wizards will finally get the chance to experience J.K. Rowling's Wizarding World. Players will learn spells, explore their real world neighborhoods and cities to discover and fight legendary beasts and team up with others to take down powerful enemies. So this sounds so great. That's pretty cool, I guess. <laughs> I just... The one reason I love it is because one of the thrills of Pokemon Go was discovery. Walking around town trying to find Pokemon, hearing that uh, or you could see in this little dashboard that a certain Pokemon is nearby, and you're like, oh my god, I don't have that one yet. i got to go get it. I walked... <laughs> I still remember like walking blocks just to go catch a Snorlax. I left my couch just to go catch a Snorlax. I really want. I, I still need a Snorlax. So Andrew, if they ever implement the the trade feature, I'm gonna have to trade with you. All right, I want like fifty bucks for the Snorlax. I left my couch <laughs> no, no, for that. No. I, I, I probably mean have a, another Pokemon that, that you might want. Okay, we'll 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 discuss this later. Okay, but so I just I wonder if this game will be as huge as Pokemon Go was at launch. I have to. Can anything be as big as Pokemon Go was at launch? I wonder. Can they trap lightning in a bottle? Can we get a blue ball flame of of Harry Potter goodness? Is there enough goodwill, and will there be enough new prospects with this new game to excite people and get them back off their couches? I think so, because Pokemon, like I said, it used to be really popular. It's not as popular, but it, it, it still has an audience, whereas Harry Potter is still really popular now, and it will also pull back all those people who used to be fans and may not still be as big of fans as they once were. So I think this is going to be huge at launch. It says you're going to be able to bump into iconic Wizarding World characters. Mm. Cast spells, discover mysterious artifacts, build your very own illustrious wizarding career. This sounds fun. Yeah, as someone yeah. who never played Pokemon Go, I can say that I'm really excited and interested in it. So, Yeah, because unlike Pokemon, you're actually interested in Harry Potter. Well, I, I will ask too, like, would Newt Scamander approve of us collecting beasts, <laughs> like going out in the wild and taking them out of their natural habitat, a.k.a. our alleys and lawns and yards. And, so it never you know, say collecting. It says fight legendary beasts. So Fight legendary. Yeah, I don't think Newt would give this the thumbs up. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's why this is called Harry Potter Wizards Unite, not Fantastic Beasts. This is mm. set in a time where we don't know that Newt exists yet. Oh, interesting. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so I'm I'm curious what the what the battle mode will be or you know I never did any of that gym stuff on uh, Pokemon Go. It was always too over my head. But I enjoyed just being able to walk around and experience things. The augmented reality of you know seeing Pokemon in your, or fantastic creatures in in your, you know, backyard and neighborhood and yeah. I I like it. I I I'm, I'm curious how this uh specifically will work. I like it too and I'm wondering how regionally, from a geographic standpoint, it's going to work out because, like with Pokemon, there were certain Pokemon that are only available in certain parts of the world. So mm. given that Harry Potter takes place in the UK, will most of the characters and beasts and spells and other things that we're accustomed to only be available over there versus really we only have the first Fantastic Beast right. film to know about much of what went on in America from a wizarding right. standpoint. So, oh, you you want you wanted a phoenix? Sorry, they're in ancient Greece. Right. You can have a puckwudgie though. <laughs> Here, and have a nice puckwudgie. A puckwudgie. Have a nice level three puckwudgie, Micah. You're in America. <laughs> you know, Mister Mime was only available over in the <laughs> UK, and I had tried for I so um, last summer when the game was really hot. I was over there, and I was checking the app every day, and it was hard for me because I didn't have data over there, so I could really only do it at the hotel, and like when <laughs> I found Wi-Fi randomly. 
and I couldn't find him day after day. And I was so sad because I didn't know when I was going to England again, and I really wanted Mr. Mime. And then the last day, like an hour before I leave my hotel, I check it into the room again, and there that little you-know-what is. And I'm like, oh, my God. So I unloaded all my best Pokeballs on him to make sure I didn't lose him, and I caught him, I'm proud to say. And I'm not selling that one to you, Micah. I don't it want would, Mr. It would Mime, be... only Snorlax. <laughs> oh, Mr. Mime. What's wrong with Mr. Mime, dude? Have I wonder you seen if we'll him? be able to like throw Newt's suitcase at these guys to like capture them. That would be fun. Yeah. Again, though, this is called Harry Potter Wizards Unite, so... Not Fantastic Beasts. Yeah, it's so weird that they're... If, if, don't, if Warner Brothers is getting into Harry Potter gaming again, and they've created this division of portkey games, which hints that there may be more in the future, I wonder why they're completely disregarding the current movie series. Yeah. And are cre- and are well, harking back to, I mean, was it really that I original HP that they is still it, to this day more marketable? Eric, it, it seems to me like the beasts are going to be involved in in some capacity. I, I don't think they're just going to completely ignore Fantastic Beasts because there has to be some capture component of this, right? You can't just mm-hmm. right. Oh, uh, maybe not. I mean, but it, it'd be weird to just see people walking around dueling each other on their phones you know in the, in the middle of new york city though i've seen stranger things in the streets of new york city so uh, this seems cool to me though i don't did they miss the boat on this a little bit though i mean i feel like it, the whole augmented reality experience with pokemon go is what makes it so unique and i just feel like they're trying to latch onto something that Maybe the, the the timing of it all has passed a little bit. Well, I don't. Ne- th- yeah, I don't think so. I think this is going to be an entirely new game. And actually, this relates to one point I want to bring up. A lot of people don't like how Niantic handled Pokemon Go. They were not able to handle the popularity of it. So with WB working with them, and it looks like WB is actually leading up the development side. I think the Antec is handling like the mapping and augmented reality side. Hopefully, yeah. they will launch a game at the very start that is loaded with features, is reliable, is not buggy, because Pokemon Go suffered a lot of those problems. Well, I will say it's exciting that Niantic themselves are making it. I mean... As soon as Pokemon Go hit, there were rumors about Harry Potter stuff. You know, it was just – it was hoaxes basically yeah. at that point. But now that we know and now that Niantic themselves are developing and have had a year or two years to learn from their you know past experiences, right. that's what excites me most is that Niantic is involved right. uh, with it directly. I am hoping that – so you can go run into characters in the real, real world. I want to go to my local gay bar – and see Dumbledore. If that doesn't happen, I will be deeply disappointed. Noted. That would Micah, be awesome. that's that's gonna be how we get you into a gay bar. We're gonna I'm gonna be like, oh Micah, you got it to do we it. We have to go catch Dumbledore. <laughs> catch Dumbledore. <laughs> <laughs> Quick, hit him with the suitcase. Quick. <laughs> but so the other side of this announcement was that, like I mentioned, there's this new Harry Potter video game group at Warner Brothers called Port Key Games, and this is amazing. So Harry Potter Wizards Unite is not going to be the only game coming down the pipeline. And I love this because the last time we got a significant Harry Potter video game was back in 2011. Mm. And it's weird that there hasn't been any big games since then. I looked. There was a Harry Potter Connect for Xbox Connect. And then there was that Book of Spells for PlayStation. But neither of those were like really, you know, big games. So it's been a while. And yet Harry Potter fever is still high and, and so so is gaming gaming is huge right now mm. so i am so excited to see what happens they're going to be developing games for console and mobile i actually wrote a list i did a wish list on hypable yesterday games i would like to see i would like to see them redo harry potter quidditch world cup yes imagine hd quidditch world cup i, oh. I can't i can't i would die i, I would can't. die too that but, game that game looked great for not being HD. Yeah. Yeah, I was watching gameplay on YouTube the other day. Yeah. It was for PlayStation 2, and for those of you who aren't familiar, you could play as Quidditch te- as all the international Quidditch teams 
that are or at least 12 of them that were mentioned in Quidditch Through the Ages. And they had home stadiums, they had special moves, and you literally went around the world like you would in any sports game. You went around the world on a campaign to win the Quidditch World Cup. And you could play as the Hogwarts house teams. Yeah, exactly. The way they did it was the tutorial was at Hogwarts when you're learning and you could choose your house and be those specific students playing like the practice and exhibition games. So it's kind of mm-hmm. like FIFA, like World Cup. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I would love to um, see but it was... EA Sports do this. <laughs> like make it a sports title. <laughs> oh, I agree. Absolutely. 100%. Just for the... The little in-between reactions that the players will have when something happens. <laughs> yeah. Which they're really good at. And they should actually scan all the actors' faces and stuff. But yeah, uh, original Quidditch World Cup was for PS2. So And, and other systems. Been... It was for oh, and other systems. GameCube, I think. and Yeah, but generationally, that's pretty much where it was. And so it's definitely due for an update. And I, I think that's, besides the LEGO games, Quidditch World Cup is... Absolutely my favorite Harry Potter game. Yeah, and you know what? Speaking of those, that's what I said, too. They should port the Lego games over to the modern consoles. They actually released Lego Harry Potter on uh, PlayStation 4 last October. So, like, yes. they're still kind of fresh in their heads development-wise, I guess. Mm-hmm. Well, and I think what it was was, I mean, Harry Potter kind of the, the what's the word, momentum sort of dried up in between films. I mean, after 2011, the last movie had come out on home video And there really wasn't an inherent or, like, a guessable direction that the the series was going in. I mean, they had gotten down to, besides Quidditch World Cup and the LEGO games, basically just doing movie games whenever a movie came out. And those were not very well received or even very good. And, you know, it's just kind of, I think, the creative juices as to, like, what they could do dried up. And now that J.K. Rowling has returned to Harry Potter and is doing these movies, and it just... You know, and then, then there's this global development team. I feel like maybe they have some more ideas in the bag that they're now re-willing or excited again to, to play with. Mm-hmm. I have an idea for an app. It's called Time Turner Twist. And I just read Prisoner of Azkaban, so that's why I got this idea. How about a game for mobile in which you have to go back in time and fix situations like Buck Beacon Sirius? And the fun of it is you have to not be spotted by wizards walking around. And mm. you have to race against the clock. So it'd be a fun little mobile game, I think. Hmm? Well, hmm? if anybody ever played, I'm I'm speaking to our listeners now. If anybody played Fantastic Beasts Cases from the Wizarding World, do you guys remember we talked about this? It it was like I think a specically a mobile game that was out around the time oh, of the last yeah. movie. Yeah, cases from that. the Wizarding World. Yeah. Here's another idea. My first beast. Another mobile game for uh it's like a Tamagotchi thing. And you, you, oh, yeah. you go into the Forbidden Forest, you try to capture a beast. There's like a hundred different types. Mm-hmm. And then the first one you capture, you got to take care of it like a, like a pet. A little, little acromantula, except sometimes it grows so big that it surpasses the screen. <laughs> Sorry, you like... need an iPhone ten in order to continue playing. <laughs> <laughs> or like uh, you go in to check on it. Oh, look, it pooped. Or, it oh, only look, recognizes it ate, your face. It ate Harry Is and Ron. Saying, Andrew? Oops. No, I'm saying you need a bigger screen to, to fit the thing oh. on the screen. Yeah. yeah, I really like the Lego games. I know, Andrew, you were talking about them before, only because they were truer to the books, where I feel like the other video games that we got tried to mirror the movies a little too much. Mm. Yeah. And, you know, it, it just it didn't have that authentic feel, whereas Arthur Parsons and the rest of the team that developed the Lego Harry Potter games, they really dove deep into the text of all of the books to make sure that they included things that the the book purists would really, really enjoy. And so yeah. my recommendation would be if you're looking for a Harry Potter video game, you know, years one to four and five to seven, although, you know, they do follow the movie storylines, there's so much books inside of those games that right. those would be my recommendations. Yeah. Absolutely. They're they're a high point for Harry Potter video gaming for sure. And and yeah, Andrew, I'm glad you reminded me that they um ported those to PS4 because I will be getting them again. Mm. You can get it all on one disc or in one set for like 30 bucks. Um nice. years 1 through 4 and years 5 through 7. Several of our patrons are listening live right now over on patreon.com/mugglecast. They wanted to read some of their feedback. Erica says, "I think it'd be interesting to be able to connect more more with the people around us." 
I got really bored with Pokemon Go just going around and catching invisible Pokemon. Yeah, and you know what, Erica? They added these, uh, these like, battles in the past few months where you had to gather at certain places with other players to, like, take on Pokemon. But I got to be honest. I don't care if it's Pokemon, Harry Potter, Bruce Springsteen. I'm not going out and meeting strangers somewhere to battle virtual anything. Like, I, I, I'm not doing that. <laughs> Are you Stranger telling me danger. if they didn't have a Bruce Springsteen meet and greet fight like members of the the E Street band <laughs> that you would that you wouldn't uh that you wouldn't be the first person in that cafe, Andrew? No. These virtual no, 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 no. I like I like the solo aspect of Pokemon Go. <laughs> <laughs> I go into a gay bar to try to find Dumbledore. Hey, what's your name? Leave me alone. I'm playing Harry Potter Wizards Unite. <laughs> <laughs> Owen says, perhaps something like Pokemon Snap, where you build a photo library of beasts rather than capture them. Yes. See, po- Pokemon Snap was a real solid game, which they also need to redo. Yeah, that game was perfect. It's for GameCube, I think. No, no. Was that the 64. one where you just take photos? Yeah. Yeah. And it's surprisingly yeah. amazing. <laughs> but you get rated off of, like, if you give them an apple, they'll do something special, like eat the apple. Or if you pelt them with a stone... They'll get angry and attack, but, like, if you take a photo of them, like, nearly killing you, Professor Oak is very impressed. And he goes, oh! Yeah. And you get, like, five stars. Yeah. Kenny says, sounds like a good way to meet strangers and get murdered. You know, that's a good point. Remember all those stories that came out around Pokemon Go? Man dies falling into lake while playing Pokemon oh, Go. Oh, yeah, or walking into traffic. I yeah. mean, it was a real thing. Blood <laughs> is going to be on J.K. Rowling's hands. No, stop. Or driving while they're playing. Yes, that was the worst. Yeah. Yeah, they or may not scary. have done that. Yeah. <laughs> there was that guy who was like drove into cop cars, like into th- into three cop cars while playing Pokemon Go while driving, and it's all caught on the dash cam. In fairness to yeah. Pokemon Go, they do say you know do not play while driving. Like every oh yeah, I mean there's up. people don't read. There's only so much you can do. But I think honestly, I think that Niantic developing this new game will take all literally all of the. Um, you know, concerns that they have from having had such a, a massive, you know, user base for Pokemon Go and turning it into something that is ultimately even more safe and perhaps even more, I don't know, n- not one note. They're you know, totally yeah. dynamic. There were some good stories, too, though, that came out of it. I remember, was it Virgin that ended up flying that one person all over the world to catch the original set of pokemon that uh oh man what that That's were cute. out there yeah i think I it was it. virgin anyway but uh yeah the guy ended up quitting his job and <laughs> i don't know that that was the best uh decision but uh yeah he got a sponsor to go and uh catch them all i wonder if he has how many are out now there's there's more right pokemon yeah they've added more um what are they called what are they called the the not generations Oh, Pokemon Go fans hate me right now, including my brother. Gen. Gen. Different generations. Is that what I just said? You yeah. just said not generations. Oh, but yeah. It's generations, okay. I think. Because they okay, call it like yeah, Gen yeah. 3, Gen 2. And the legendary birds, right? And and others yeah. have been uh, released. Yeah. Hey, our first sponsor this week is Blue Apron. Their mission is to make incredible home cooking accessible to everyone. And by incredible, they mean fresh, authentic, and delicious For example, since Blue Apron has established partnerships with over 150 local farms, fisheries, and ranchers across the U.S., beef, chicken, and pork come from responsibly raised animals. And like I said, they're accessible. Each meal comes with a step-by-step, easy-to-follow recipe card and pre-portioned ingredients. They can be prepared in 40 minutes or less, even if you're a noob like me. In my experience, cooking has taken the time that they tell you, and they taste as good as they promise. I love cooking with Blue Apron because they don't repeat meals in a span of a year. So you, a new chef or maybe an experienced one, you're cooking up new stuff throughout the year. Check out this week's menu and get $30 off your first order with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash mugglecast. You will love how good it feels and tastes to create incredible home-cooked meals with Blue Apron. So don't wait. That's blueapron.com slash mugglecast. Blue Apron is a better way to cook. So one small little thing we want to mention, and then we may do a larger discussion on it because I think it's important. On Portkey Games' FAQ page, they explicitly state that these games will not 
should not be considered canon. They say these are games that have been created for the fans by game makers who themselves are fans of and have been inspired by the Wizarding World. Huh. They also say that J.K. Rowling is supportive of Port Key Games and has entrusted the design and creation of the games to WB Games and the developers involved. I find this significant because, as far as I know, this is the first time where they're making these mass Harry Potter products, a Harry Potter product that re- reaches a mass audience that isn't canon. And it makes me wonder if if J.K. Rowling is loosening the reins, could we see this looser attitude spread into movies or the one big aspect of the Harry Potter franchise that still has a hole in it, television? Mm. I think this is J.K. Rowling slowly stepping into a different world, a, a different way of managing Harry Potter, because if they're not canon... And and we already know that there are going to be a mix of new and old characters and locations. This is really opening things up. So, yeah. yeah. Part of me is kind of hesitant about it because I can be such a book snob. But at the same time, I'm trying to be open minded because if it gets more people interested and if it gets more people into the fandom, then it can't be a bad thing. So that's true. All right. Well, we'll touch on this in a future episode. Maybe if we can make a discussion out of it. One question real quick, though, before we move on is, is what specifically are we talking about when we say that it won't be considered canon? Like I'm characters like that show up, spells, that sort of spells, thing? Spells, events that happen in these video games. I guess it depends what kind of video games these are. Like, is it a, is it a role-playing game? Are these games with storylines? If it's just, yeah. you know, time-turner twist... There's not going to be any canon in it. It's just a little challenge. But like, if you're doing an expansive video game, there's going to be a story there. True. Right. And it should not be considered canon. Hmm. But what is canon are these beasts found in the new Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them Illustrated Edition. We had kind of laughed this off when they announced it a few months ago. But um, it's pretty darn nice. <laughs> <laughs> As we all know, every year... They've been releasing a new illustrated edition of the Harry Potter books. We're up to Prisoner of Azkaban. That just came out in October. And now they seem to be stretching into the spinoff books as well. This one is not illustrated by Jim Kay. It's illustrated by Olivia Lomenic Gill. It's about the same size as the Harry Potter illustrated editions. It's a hardbound book. It's gorgeous. And it's it's a replica of the Fantastic Beast book that was re-released earlier this year, which was originally the book released in 2001 or two. Right. So remember, it was updated earlier this year to get some of the movie stuff in, and now that updated version has an illustrated edition. And a lot of information in there, I mean, I don't know how in-depth we went when Fantastic Beast was released earlier, but... I found a lot of things in there that I didn't know and I thought were were interesting and I know we'll discuss them. I did have another delivery issue, not that uh I should harp on it, but uh, Oh man. It was absolutely a uh, torrential rain earlier this week when uh this illustrated edition was delivered and I'm not saying it's Amazon's fault, clearly it's the fault of the postal service that delivers it, but you know the hardcover at least came in a like a paper cardboard little box and it was just left outside so i'm not sure if rain. some of my some of my beasts run together oh no it's it's actually not that bad i would say all things considered it's in pretty good condition but there are some pages that you can tell are a little bit warped because uh oh that's too bad the rain uh got to it yeah well, my big question is, do they have the typo with hippogriff that the that the updated Fantastic Beast did? Do they have the second paragraph of the hippogriff? I'm looking right now. I didn't look. But Eric, I know Eric. Um, you perused this originally through at Target earlier this week, and you were blown away, weren't you? I, w- I was truly blown away. I, I love to be skeptical, but yeah, absolutely. How long were you this at Target? Is, this is just – there are full-page spreads – and uh, co- obviously a couple of uh, different creatures that I'd love to get into uh, specifics on the artwork, but mm-hmm. it's a beautiful book, and they really use sort of the full range of color 
Olivia Gill did a really nice job capturing it. And pretty much every beast has an illustration, which even in the original comic relief book of Fantastic Beasts, there were maybe a couple hand sketches from J.K. Rowling, which made that special. But a lot of the beasts, and especially with how creatively they're described, you do kind of want a visual component to them. So this is finally that book and, that will please you. And what I find interesting is it doesn't seem like this particular illustrator was influenced all that much by what was in the film. Right. They they definitely took their, their own interpretation of a lot of the beasts that we do see in uh, Fantastic Beasts. But one thing, just to mention here at the top, because I know we discussed this actually on last week's episode uh, when we were talking about the reveal that uh, Newt is going to have a launch party for his book in, in the next movie, hmm. Obscurus Books. We were wondering the coincidence in the, in the fact that uh, Newt would go to a publisher with Obscurus in its name. Is he, in fact, a self-publisher? And this was his own uh, company that he was uh, going to be publishing under. But it looks like the first edition of Fantastic Beasts was commissioned back in 1918. So he didn't even write the first version of this by Mr. Augustus Worm of Obscurus Books. Uh, and he was the one who went to Newton and said, hey, would you consider writing an authoritative compendium of magical creatures for this publishing house? And uh, we all know that uh, Newt decided to go and do that. So that answers that question. So this is information from the foreword by Newt? Yeah, it's it's in those first couple of pages. I think it's an introduction, mm -hmm. and it's mentioned that... Uh, Augustus Worm uh, made this proposal to Newt. I don't like it. So I why? Like it I don't either, because why did he call it Obscurus Books? Yeah. And did, did he somehow know what Newt's destiny would be and Dumbledore's destiny would be to encounter actual Obscurials and Obscuruses? And what a weird guy. Yeah. I, I don't like this at and, all. And Unless I we're going to meet right, Augustus though? Worm. Uh, I just want to make sure I'm to... reading it right about him not being the first person to write Fantastic Beasts, or or is he well just commissioning saying... is just like right, like I'll pay you money oh, if you okay. want to get okay something to get. It's just like funding. Like Augustus Worm produced this book, so in it it sounds like from this that it took Newt a little less than ten years to put this all together, like J.K. Rowling and Harry Potter. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, it's interesting. So what I mean, year was it, it, this published in canon? 28, right? 20, oh, 28. right, yeah, because the book release party. Yeah. Okay. Hmm, hmm, hmm. I mean, that makes yeah. sense. He has to do a lot of traveling and research and stuff. At 10 years doesn't seem totally irrational. You're I right. wonder if, War if Mr. Worm approached Newt the day he got expelled from Hogwarts or the day after. It said he was already he, working for the ministry. Yeah, so it's just like, hey, they probably... At a lunch break together or something, if Newt was in London. Who is the first person to name... What if... Could Newt have named the Obscurus an Obscurus because he was writing for Obscurus books? <laughs> like, this is my beast. I discovered like, it. I get to name right. it. Right. Did he discover it? That's what I'm trying to remember. It's not a bad idea. I don't think so because all the Americans know what it is. Mm. And that information wouldn't have traveled that mm. quickly to another continent. Yeah. Right. Um, and this publisher has already named Obscurus Books. Or are you I'm just saying, trying like, to figure out what's the origin of the Obscurus. Who was the first to name it such? Because well, if it had an entry, we, we would be able to uh, maybe know the answer, but uh, it's not in the You know the what? Book. I'm going to look up. What weren't Obscuruses touched on specifically on Pottermore after the maybe. fact? I feel like that little tidbit, that little nugget of information would be on Pottermore. Well, so let me look. while you do that... Nikki, did you have a chance to go through the book? Uh, I have not because, like I mentioned earlier, my birthday is coming up and all of my friends and family know I want this book. So I have stopped <laughs> myself from purchasing it. So. Yeah. yeah. Well, what do you think about the illustrated editions on a whole? Like the, the first like three? Like the Harry Potter ones, yeah. Oh, they're amazing. Yeah. We've had to control ourselves and only buy like one copy as a, as a family, but... 
Well, that's the good thing, right? I mean, you guys live together, so you don't have to buy two. Like, Eric, Micah, and I, we don't live together, so we have to buy three of these darn things. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> all the other Harry Potter stuff we own, we have, like, between the two of us, like, six copies of all of the books. So it's nice. Really? To, yeah. So, Do you have, like, one set on display? Do you have both your sets on display? Like, how does that work? We actually bickered about it, about who's <laughs> got to go on display, and I think... Robert's are in better condition, so his are like in prominent display, but mine are on a lower shelf, but they're still displayed because I would not give in. But that's not a good that's not a good reason to display his higher because I think if they look more worn, they're they're cooler that way. You know? They're like pieces of history. Yeah, Robert's a little bit of a perfectionist though, so the <laughs> I see. Yeah. <laughs> no wonder your audio is so good. Yep. <laughs> no, but anyway, uh Oh, this, I love I, them. They're great. Cool. This book, I noticed the paper in this is noticeably different. It's like a, it seems like a thicker paper, and like a, yeah. like a drier paper. And the illustrations, they, they almost, they're almost like sketches. They, they kind of all look like rough sketches, and I don't mean that in a bad way. Not all of them. It's just the style, almost like watercolors. It's just so different than the typical Harry Potter illustrated editions, and I like that because if you. If you look at this as an actual encyclopedia, it's almost like Newt was like sketching these beasts as he discovered them himself. Yeah. And there are also, and I assume this is what the illustrator was going for, there are a lot of pictures of a boy slash a man throughout the book who I think is supposed to be Newt. Like in the oh. About the Author section, there's this gorgeous photo of, of Newt. In searching his, for that right now in his older years and i just i just love these different takes on him he doesn't look anything like the newt in the movie played by eddie redmayne he, mm -hmm. he just like looks like more like an adult <laughs> well um andrew on your point about sketches page 113 has a really amazing full color illustration of a snidget as in golden snidget yeah which is less sketched i i understand what you're saying like a lot of these some of these darker creatures, too, are just, like, charcoal renderings, which makes them spooky. But I certainly wouldn't want people to think that's all there is in here. No, they're very detailed and very yeah. colorful. It's just that, that the style is, is, like, not what you would be expecting, I don't think. Right. And like I said earlier, we were kind of laughing this off, but I think an illustrated edition is a perfect mashup for an encyclopedia like this. It lends itself yeah. perfectly. I agree. There's also a couple areas where the pages pull out to reveal larger beasts. Yes. Um, you said a couple of pages? I found the Ukrainian Iron Belly. Is that the one that expands the four pages? Yeah, all four pages. It's unbelievable. I think there's one more. I might be wrong on that. I'm trying to find them. but The cool thing about the Ukrainian Iron Belly being a four-page thing is that these are the dragons that Newt himself said that he worked with during World War I. Yeah. As heard in the Fantastic Beasts film, he tells this to Jacob when they're walking to Central Park. Micah, what do you think of this book? Outside of it being a little damp. <laughs> Stop. No, I, I agree with everything that's been said in terms of uh, it being a nice compendium of sorts to uh, the movie. But even going beyond that, I think it can give us a little bit of insight into what to expect in future films. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of background there. On, on the history of what defines a beast, which was interesting to read, and really how they continue to be concealed from our eyes. There, there were a few instances that were kind of funny. You know, I'm, I'm thinking of uh, the Duracall. Um, and it was once known to us as the dodo bird, and as we all know, the dodo bird went extinct, so technically it didn't really go extinct. We just are unable to see it anymore. I love J.K. Rowling. Uh, and she did something like that with the Loch Ness Monster. She said that, or I should say Newt said, that the world's largest Kelpie is found in Loch Ness, which is leading us to believe that that is really what the Loch Ness Monster is. Mm. Mm. So I, it's I would hilarious. highly recommend, yeah, for people, if they don't go and get it, uh, at least go to Target and stand in the aisle and peruse it for hours on end. Right, Eric? Yeah, or be like Andrew and, and buy it at Barnes & Noble, and then a week later, you know, just <laughs> Return kind of it. ask yourself if you really need another giant coffee table book. 
occupying your apartment. It is kind of cracking me up that these illustrated editions are quickly piling up. Like we just got these two. Plus, they are huge. We'll talk about this one later this month. There's the Art of Harry Potter book, which is also very large, and then there's that book based on the Harry Potter exhibit at the British Library that we're gonna that we talked about a couple weeks ago. It's like there's so many books this holiday season. They're all very good, by the way. It's just there's so many. Yeah. What what do you think about the fact that each wizarding governing body, depending on where they are in the world, is responsible for concealing that selection of beasts? Makes the most sense. If a beast is has broken out or needs to be contained, it seems ill advised that some kind of international team would show up, there'd just be so much red tape, so much more red tape to enter someone's country, right, to contain a beast especially with each country having its own different differing opinion on, you know, secrecy and how to enforce it. Mm-hmm. I feel like it makes you- the most sense for, you know, the initial and then if something is uncontrollable and you need to call in aid, like in like in our world, like you, our government tries to handle stuff and then if it gets out of control then you call in international if you need to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that definitely makes sense and and Newt goes into detail in terms of how these beasts are concealed. There's safe habitats, controls on selling and breeding, disillusionment charms, memory charms, and also the Office of Misinformation can step in if needed. So just a lot of information, I think, throughout this entire book, like I was saying earlier, that I never would have picked up on before. And I think certainly as more movies start to be released, that these beasts will become more and more important. Was that information not in the old ones? Because I feel like I remember reading, you know, that kind it of stuff. It probably about... was. I just, I don't, I'll be honest, I never read the original Fantastic Beasts. Oh. Hmm. Well, and I was also going to ask, does the fact that there's pictures in this help keep your attention? <laughs> <laughs> like me personally? Yeah, yeah I Yeah, because so. you're noticing stuff. Well, mine too, exactly, yeah. Like... It's it's true. I don't think that's anything to be ashamed about. Mm-hmm. I'm pretty right. sure all of that stuff was in the old one because I've read it and I remember being like super interested in all of that part because I'm a veterinarian. So I care about the control and the treatment oh, and stuff. So I remember specifically reading all of that in detail. Mm-hmm. Was the was the story of a Jarvi in the original one? I do not believe so. No. Yeah, yeah. because when they did the re-release, they added some beasts. And I think... Yeah. That was probably one of them. Mm-hmm. Well, the Jarvie is in the is part of the eighty one beast that Newt you know, details out, but he also tells a story about a Jarvie in the introduction in the first couple of pages. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's uh, a section, a subheading called "A Brief History of Muggle Awareness of Fantastic Beasts" on page X one through mm-hmm. X thir- on page thirteen. And given what we know about his expulsion from Hogwarts or supposedly that it had something to do with a Jarvey. I didn't know if we should be paying extra attention to that. Was it a Jarvey that was involved in the Hogwarts incident? Yes. Oh, okay. I'm forgetting that. But we haven't seen it yet on screen. Right. But we will. Okay. Well, that could be a little hint. I mean, what does he say about the Jarvey? It attacks uh, someone in the uh, monastery. So who knows? Maybe it was the fat friar. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, man. Okay, what else do we want to talk about here? I mean, I took some random notes as I was going through the book, some of it having to do with beasts that we know of and pieces of information that, at least having not read the original Fantastic Beast, I found to be uh, interesting. Uh, So I'll just go through. Mike's attention. Yeah, aside from the pictures. Aside from the pictures. So the the first recorded basilisk was bred by Herpo the Fowl, a Greek dark wizard and a parcel mouth. Hmm. Who knew? Who knew? Who knew? Billy Wigs, which we see one many times throughout, kind of like zooming by in uh, the Fantastic Beasts film. They're clearly, their stingers are all the rage in Australia. Uh, it, it sounds almost like if you get stung by one, you go on like a acid trip. Hmm. <laughs> You levitate into the air, and so maybe we should uh, look into uh, capturing a few of those for for our own purposes. <laughs> yeah, definitely. In the Harry Potter go. Uh, bow truckles, while very peaceful creatures, right? Thinking of Pickett, 
Oh. They will rip your effing eyes out if you try and harm their trees. <laughs> Does he use that word in the book? Is that a direct quote from uh, <laughs> that is uh, that is somewhat paraphrased. Uh. That would have been a nice little element in the movie. Like Jacob tries to move in on one of their trees, and then they lose their mind. And yeah. he's like, "Oh no, no, you can't mess with their trees." Mm-hmm. So they they use their very sharp fingers to essentially claw people's eyes out. I mentioned the the bit about the dodo bird earlier, and I think we touched on the the ten breeds of dragons, which I think is probably one of the standout sections of the book. Agree, disagree? Uh, I need to look at that again. But that w- I mean, we all love dragons, so that would be a cool thing to read through. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I was going to say, are we going through sort of what our favorite beasts are? I know we've already said that in previous iterations of this. One of my favorite drawings in this book is right at the start of the dragon section, which is the, of course, Antipodean Opali. And they actually managed to – there's a little bit of muggle cast history here. That was the dragon we incorrectly speculated was on the cover of the <laughs> deluxe Deathly Hallows, but but not for a lack of evidence. I would say that that is still one of the most astute wrong theories that we've ever conjectured. <laughs> but in this, um, in this drawing, there's a bunch of kangaroos, which I just – I love – so I'm kind of hung up about this, uh, the start of this dragon section, and that's on page 27. It's okay. a lovely centerfold kind of you know, two-page spread with a bunch of kangaroos, and I think that the dragon is about to eat them, so that's a little sad. All right, so that's new information we can add to canon. Dragons eat kangaroos. Oh, yeah, it's uh, a just... beautiful, that's a beautiful picture. Jeez. Yeah. Wow. Some of these I would, un- would, would want to frame on my wall. By the way, I was going to buy the um, digital edition of this book because it's animated. And I thought, like, you know, getting back to my earlier point, like, there's so many books right now. Do I really need another physical one? But the the digital illustrated edition isn't out till like, February. So I was like, ah, that's how they get mm. you. But it would have been cool because the Beast would have been moving. Wait, what illustrated version? Of Fantastic Beasts. They're the animating it slightly. Remember they released the Sorcerer's Stone Illustrated on Kindle? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And it's slightly animated. I assume they're going to do that with the other books as well. They just haven't yet. So I, just, I just looked into Kindles for the first time the other day. We got to talk about them. Don't get a Kindle. Get an iPad. Mm. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, that was easy. <laughs> because you want the moving stuff. The Kindle's not going to do the moving the traditional oh, e-book. Oh, I thought it was iPads that didn't have, like, Flash and animation and stuff. No, it does. Ah. This, uh, through the Kindle app. Oh. Anyway. So you'll be able to see bow truckles ripping people's eyes out. <laughs> yes. <laughs> exactly. One one funny bit of inf- – well, it's not really that funny, but uh, the funny scene from uh, Fantastic Beasts with Jacob and the Arumpet. It seems that um, Arumpets are, are somewhat uh, endangered. Uh, many – actually end up, the males at least, frequently exploding each other during mating season as they contest for uh, females to mate with. Hmm. Love it. Leatherfolds are, are repelled by the Patronus charm, much like Dementors are. There's a great Leatherfold story uh, in this book. There's a lot of stories, actually, about sort of the first known wizards or witches to come across a lot of these creatures, so definitely recommend people to uh, to read those. Yeah, I don't know that this is much of a surprise, but nifflers are often used by goblins in search of treasure. Uh, that's a uh, smart yep. idea. I saw one in Deathly Hollows. Come to think of it, I feel like nifflers are too cute to be used by goblins. <laughs> um, hey, wait a minute. I think that's a prejudiced statement, and I'd love to explore <laughs> why you feel that way. I just think nifflers are adorable, and when you use them for evil, that's just not nice. Maybe. Well, I, I mean, take into account. Can we? what the Niffler feels about finding treasure. It's probably the, the happiest day of its life when it can find treasure. And who is more preoccupied with finding treasure than garters and creators of vaults? True. Maybe I feel goblins. Like as long as the Niffler's getting to do what it wants, it doesn't care who it's doing it for. So, Yeah. Maybe goblins are jealous of the Niffler's good looks, so they want to hang out together. Or maybe like... Oh, no, okay, that some... was a prejudiced remark. <laughs> Rub off on um, some of them. But yeah, I, I, I'm choosing to see it as a... A wonderful win-win situation. Mm-hmm. And then uh, we have Puffskines, Puffskins. 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 Uh, they look like Pygmy Puffs a little bit. 
Yep, they're uh, bigger. They they would make great modern day vacuum cleaners because uh, they have <laughs> these really elongated tongues that just love to uh, sop everything up. Uh, but apparently, they're well known for uh, eating boogers. That's <laughs> that's their uh, like the birdie bots flavored boogers no, or like, real like, ones. No, like real boogers. They love going up wizards' nose and cleaning Ew. them out. Ew. Yeah. So kids Sold. love them. Okay. Yeah. And then uh, finally, one other note that I had was that Thunderbirds are so sensitive to supernatural danger that wands created with their feathers have been known to fire preemptively. I love that. So cool. those are just Micah's notes on uh, the illustrated edition. Yeah, I loved every one of those. Did any of you guys listen to the audiobook version that was narrated by Eddie Redmayne? Oh, no, I forgot that was a thing. Oh, so I held off on buying it because I had a feeling the Illustrated Edition was going to be coming out, and I just downloaded the audio version, and it was awesome. It was so much fun to listen to. He reads the whole book? Yeah. Oh, that's, and there's oh, that's like, cool. And there's, like, sound effects in the background, like dragons screeching and, like, snuffling oh, noises wow. and stuff. So it was... Where do you where do you buy it? Audible. Okay. And coming next year, there's going to be a audiobook illustrated edition. <laughs> so look forward to that. That doesn't make sense. It just doesn't stop, does it? All right. Well, thank you, Micah, for your notes there. We look forward to Quidditch Through the Ages illustrated edition. So Micah actually reads it yeah. and <laughs> shares some intro info with yeah. us for the first time. Uh, one final question, though, related to the illustrated edition was, you know, having looked through the book. Are there any beasts in particular that you want to see in upcoming films? And you can't say all of them. That's not. Definitely the Antipodean Opali. That that needs to be canonized in a film. I feel like we're going to get a lot of dragons. Uh, Yeah, that's a, that's a good point, actually. Dragons are in right now. Thanks, Game of Thrones. <laughs> yeah, I, it was cool seeing the mer people again, and it made me kind of miss them, so I wouldn't mind seeing them maybe pop out at uh, Hogwarts. It'd be nice to see a unicorn alive and not being consumed by a half-alive creature. Touché. Right? They exist, presumably, in the Forbidden Forest, so they're at least Hogwarts adjacent. Yeah. They're native to uh, Europe, according to this book. I, I had a laugh, though, after I turned just a couple pages and came across uh, the augury. <laughs> yeah. Hodag, the Hodag seems pretty cool. It's like a giant dog. Really, really, really giant. Like, he's like 50 times the size of a tree. There's this illustration that shows him, like, in a forest, and the cabins and trees around him look super small. So, who are you calling a Hodag? <laughs> <laughs> one, one thing this made me realize, though, is, as I was going through the book, is that there are a lot of beasts in here that could be considered on the dark side or the evil side of things. So mm -hmm. I wonder as we progress through the films, how they may come into play. Are they beasts that could be rallied to Grindelwald's cause? Mm -hmm. It's interesting. I'm looking at this beast that I've never noticed before in writing. And it's called the Tebo T E B O or Tebo Tebo. I'm thinking it, it's in, it's located in Congo and Zaire. So South America or no, no Jesus, Africa. And I feel like Egypt and Africa in general has been mentioned before in the Fantastic Beast series, maybe already, as Newt was visiting somewhere in Africa, I think, um, or Sudan, where he found the Obscurus. He's definitely been there before. And I'm wondering if the Tebow is another one of these beasts that is clearly like a plant that we will see more of in the future. I mean, it's not a plant. It's actually a very large bull. But apparently, Tebow hide is highly prized by wizards for protective shields and clothing. It's very possible we'll see, you know, a formidable enemy using specially shielded Tebow hide in their garment or something. You know, any, any kind of hide that protects against spells. I think we've seen, like, it's been speculated in, I'm trying to remember if it was Half-Blood Prince, whether Hagrid, you know, had thicker skin that could somehow withstand spells, because he does withstand a lot of spells, but it's never really proven. And um, Tebow, this beast, seems like it would be a step in that direction of, mm -hmm. you know, what skin can repel spells? Because it's not really... Spells aren't physical, necessarily, right? Yeah. Right. Just to go off so. your point, though, I think 
one thing that that does show when you're talking about where he he's traveled to is just he's been on five continents he's been so many different places around the world in just this very short period of time right if if he was commissioned to write this book in 1918 and now we're 10 years later that's not a a a long period of time to travel five continents to study all of these beasts you know it, it amazed me all the different places he would have had to have gone in order to write a lot of of, of these descriptions that he's writing sure that's why he I mean, was commissioned got to put up a lot of money to do this yeah i mean who funded his his travels although you know wizards are capable of traveling great distances without paying a single bus fare so it's possible that it's actually quite cheaper to travel when you're a wizard and you can find your own food quite easily. And I think Newt has a particular proclivity for, I'm not going to say pyrotechnics, fitting in with beasts. Mm-hmm. You know, like I think the reason that he was able to investigate and write about this many beasts in 10 years, which is a relatively short time, is just due to his natural sort of um, instinct to – observe and catalog and interact with the beasts so that's our review of fantastic beasts illustrated edition i would say buy it but i would probably prioritize prisoner of azkaban illustrated that british exhibit book british library exhibit book i would prioritize you know what i'm I'm gonna go ahead and say that i find these illustrations to be more beautiful than jim k's illustrations for prisoner of azkaban so if we're buying Mike a Christmas gift this year, you give him the Fantastic Beasts Illustrated Edition? Like if you could only which, give him one thing? Well, which he already has. But, but, yeah. no, well, but, but a pretend driver, he has none of these. A dry version. A dry version. Oh, okay. That's, That's easy. a good idea. Yeah. I would give him uh, I would give him the, the, the British Library exhibit book. Ah, so we know that uh, – you're not going to splurge the seventy dollars for the, it, uh, though, another Harry Potter art book. I'll sign it for you, sure, Mike. I don't know why you would want that, but okay. Hmm. Yeah. Nikki, do you, do you and Robert frequently exchange Harry Potter gifts? It kind of sounds like you does. You yes. do. Yes, <laughs> very frequently. Oh, that's so cute. <laughs> yeah. You should send us a picture of like your display if you don't mind. Like if you got like your Harry Potter display, I would like to see that. Oh, we do. It's right behind me right now. <laughs> so. Oh, that's awesome. Send the picture after the show. Maybe we post it okay. in the show notes with your permission. And if you have one of those empty uh, carved out books with credit cards in it, we won't tell anybody. Okay. <laughs> like Eric does. It's time to tell you about our second sponsor this week. They are Canvas People. I love these guys. They can turn any photo you take on your phone, maybe your fancy camera, etc., and turn it into a beautiful piece of artwork for hanging in your home. I took a photo that I snapped on my iPhone of my dog Brooklyn and ordered an 11 by 14 canvas from Canvas People. It turned out so good. They're simple, they're easy to hang, and they're a perfect way to make a special moment permanent. Don't let your favorite moments stay hidden away deep in your camera roll. We let so many great photos just fade away deep into the smartphone. You can bring them to life with Canvas People. The canvases are made right here in the U.S., contributing to 250-plus manufacturing jobs, which is awesome. And I have a special deal for listeners. Normally, 11 by 14 canvases are priced at $69.99, but for a limited time, you can get one free 11 by 14 canvas. Just pay shipping. Go to canvaspeople.com and use code MUGGLE. Yes, this deal really is as good as it sounds. Go to canvaspeople.com and use code MUGGLE at checkout to get a free 11 by 14 canvas. All you got to do is pay shipping. With the holidays coming up, by the way, this is a personal, unique, and affordable, thanks to this coupon, gift idea for a loved one. Check it out. You are not going to be disappointed. Find a great picture, upload it to canvaspeople.com, use code MUGGLE, and you are going to be a happy person. All right, so let's get our listeners involved here for the rest of the episode. We asked on Patreon in regards to this new app, what are your dream features for Harry Potter Wizards Unite? Amy said, I want to be able to cast spells on things in the real world. With the augmented reality, we could see the effects of our spells right on our phones. It could be so fun. Yeah, that's a good point. I was actually thinking about this. Maybe we'll be like instructed to 
wave our phone a certain way in order to get a, in in order to conjure a spell because like phones are that high tech where you can move them in certain ways and it'll know that you're moving in a particular direction and with augmented reality we see what snapchat does with augmented reality um where these where these lenses wrap around our face spells could actually wrap around particular objects in the real world so that would be super cool yeah Stephanie says, wizard dueling in place of the gym system. I want to put Slytherin green all over my town map. <laughs> that would be cool. <laughs> my ambitious nature is showing, she says. Caitlin says, somehow incorporating the Triwizard Tournament would be cool. Maybe if once you reach a certain level in order to advance, you have to complete the first task, and then so on and so forth. Also, does anyone else really want them to have the eggs so we can hatch a dragon and name it Norbert? <laughs> <laughs> That's cool, but I would like them to avoid all comparisons to Pokemon Go. So, like, maybe not do eggs. Adam says, I have so many things I'd like to see. House competitions, group spells, searching for magical ingredients for enhancing potions, access to a full-fledged Hogwarts or Ilvermorny library at a real library location to learn new spells. I can't wait. Love it. Yeah, I thought about the whole, like, it says you have to go collect artifacts, so I thought for sure you could go collect potion ingredients, because they had something like that on Pottermore, where you had to, like, collect potion ingredients and brew a potion, and you had to, like, wait something like 30 or 60 minutes for the potion to brew, and that was kind of a pain on your computer, because you couldn't get up and leave, but on your phone, that would be way easier. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of Pottermore, I was thinking maybe there's going to be Pottermore integration with Wizards Unite. So, like, you can log in with your Pottermore account, and then you'll automatically get your your Hogwarts and Ilvermorny houses, your Patronus, your wands. Yeah, maybe. That would be smart. That would be smart. But on the other hand, people may want to just, like, decide on their own instead of getting sorted, I wonder. so Because, it's like, how many official Harry, uh, how many official tests do we need to take? Like, shouldn't we just have one account that holds all of our results the first time we take these official tests you know maybe there will be in the few years a a established official harry potter fandom id yes you know? all these games know exactly where we come from and what we're all about Faye says it'd be awesome if when you see if when you come across something or somewhere unplottable your phone will transform it so you see what wizards see and if it's an extra special unplottable location you collect a chocolate frog card when you're there example mm-hmm. If you visit the house that was used in filming as the Potters' home, your phone transforms it to show it's still destroyed, just like it was left in the books, and you get chocolate frog cards for Lily and James. That would be cool. Yeah. Finally, I'll read one more. I'll read two more. Jen says, I'm more of an explorer, so a lot of items to find. Ingredients for potions, collectibles, etc. Special check-in abilities where you can get a special item or advantage at key HP places. Like the Wizarding World Parks, filming locations. Picking up magical creatures and having to care for them would be neat. I'm deaf a Hufflepuff in that I don't necessarily want to duel. So expanding and offering multiple types of of experiences is what I'm hoping so that it appeals to everyone. I agree with that. And finally, from Nolan. Does anyone think this could potentially link with your pot? Oh, I kind of already suggested that. Nolan, I got the same idea as you. Yay. Or did you steal his idea? No, I didn't. I hadn't read that, read that one, but I was planning on reading it because it had a lot of likes. So, yeah. But yeah, no, I'm 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 with y'all on that. All right, now to some emails, Eric. We got one brilliant email. A lot of what we're getting in our email inbox now is notifications for all the voicemails and text messages <laughs> that we are getting. Keep those coming, but we also love to hear from you via the old-fashioned way, aka MuggleCast at Gmail dot com. I had to look that up. So, <laughs> e- email us. As Riley did, Riley has a really interesting suggestion via email. The subject of the email is Newt Scamander and the Philosopher's Stone. And this ties all the new info about Nicholas Flamel in with what we might see in an unexpected way. So Riley writes, hey guys, with Nicholas Flamel in FB2, do you think that Newt would have to use the Philosopher's Stone to keep Credence alive while removing his Obscurus? Just a possibility, but since the Sudanese girl died, he might want to be sure that Credence would survive. Love your show, by the way. Yeah, that's a cool idea. But I never thought of this. But if you're using the stone, doesn't that mean he would live forever? No, because Nicholas Fomel also does not live forever. So 
drinking the elixir of life, which is created somehow by the Philosopher's Stone, will give you immortality, will prevent you from death, but apparently it has its own limits. So it's kind of a really kind of um, ingenious solution to the problem of removing an Obscurus kills its host. I just assumed that Flamel stopped taking the elixir. Well, yeah, that's, I mean, they destroy the stone, or Dumbledore assures Harry at the end of book one that the stone has been destroyed, and Harry somehow precognitively knows that that means that Nicholas Flamel can no longer become immortal. And that's why you get that line from Dumbledore that says he has enough elixir left to sort out his affairs, but then, yes, he will die. Uh, just looking at this subject line, Newt's Commander and the Philosopher's Stone, how cool would it be if they titled the movie that? Yeah. We would be like, oh, snap. This is like the first Harry Potter movie title, and now they're spinning it on its head. Oh, snap. I would love it. But I that. love it because it gives something very central for for Nicholas Flamel to do. We know he's been cast. We had a whole episode about it. But he could help save a life. It would be great. How to save a life with my Philosopher's Stone. <laughs> okay, let's listen to a couple of voicemails now. Hi, this is Evelyn. I'm calling about a theory. So there's a theory about Professor Trelawney whenever he was talking about Harry's birthday. Even though he was born in July, she said that he was born in midwinter. And that's kind of true because part of Voldemort's soul is inside of Harry. And Tom Riddle was born on December 31st, which is right in the middle of the winter season. Just something to think about. That's a cool little theory, and I liked it because I, like I said, just read Prisoner of Azkaban, so I've been studying Professor Trelawney's theories a lot. What do you guys think? I, I did a little Googling on this. There's this quote from Goblet of Fire. She says, Saturn, dear, the planet Saturn. I was saying that Saturn was surely in a position of power in the heavens at the moment of your birth. Your dark hair, your mean stature, tragic losses so young in life. I think I am right in saying, my dear, that you were born in midwinter. Makes sense if, uh, you know, she's not always right, <laughs> as Professor McGonagall would tell you. But right. every once in a while, she's she's kind of on the right track. And that's kind of on the right track if a piece of Voldemort is inside of Harry. Yeah, that's pretty spooky. Yeah, I I like it. She's right and wrong at both at the same time. <laughs> All right, here's an adorable voicemail. Hi, Mugglehead. My name is Frankie. I am seven years old and have been living since I was in my mom's belly. I am reading the book for the first time by myself. How old were you when you read the book? What made you want, want to start a podcast? about Harry Potter. Thank you, and I love your show. Goodbye. <laughs> so that's Frankie. He's seven, and he said he's been listening since he was in his mom's belly. Yep. <laughs> Cutest child ever. Yeah, for real. I feel and like he was getting fed those questions, though. I think he was reading from a script. That was That was cute, though. There's nothing wrong with that. Of course not. Of course not. I started reading Harry Potter by my fourth grade teacher, read Harry Potter to my class. So I was pretty young. Not as young You're as like you, nine. though. Hmm? You were like nine or ten. Yeah, yeah, probably. And I then I wrote a note to my favorite Harry Potter podcast. Oh. <laughs> I was 13. I'm trying to remember how old I was. Early 20s, I think. Yeah. How about you, Nikki? Um, I was in third or fourth grade. Oh, okay. So, yeah, around yeah. the same time as me. That's cool. Yeah, and then we started the podcast when we thought that uh, there should be a podcast about Harry Potter. And the rest the first. is history. Did you guys ever have the AR points where you had to like take the test on books you read? And then because you'd already read Harry Potter, you got like all your AR points for the whole semester. AR, Accelerated Reader. Yeah. We did that in seventh grade, which ironically is why I first started to try to read Harry Potter. Oh. Because Goblet of Fire was worth like 22 <laughs> AR points. Yeah. It was like a quarter and a half's worth of points. But no, I, I, I didn't like Goblet of Fire and I didn't I therefore did not complete the book 
to take the quiz. My classmates had like logged in and had me take the Harry Potter quizzes for them so they could get the points. Oh, man. <laughs> That's amazing. And also you have to now repeat seventh grade now that you've admitted yep. that. <laughs> I never did advanced reading. I, I, that, I didn't know what you meant when you said AR points. Oh, I'm glad so. Eric did so I didn't sound crazy. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's just, a, it's just a program. They did in the um, certain educational, certain schools – you know, it just went to public school, but like they had this thing called Accelerated Reader, which was integrated into the English program, and you would read pretty much any assortment of books. There was a computer network or a computer spreadsheet that would just quiz you on reading comprehension, and that was literally all it was. I ended up reading that year probably about 12 Nancy Drew books because they were all worth like four points, which wasn't much. You had sort of a quota that you needed to hit, but I mean they were easier to digest – than something like Lord of the Rings. And then you could use your AR points to like buy candy and buy stuff. So, Oh, oh we didn't have that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. One more voicemail today. Hi guys. My name is Abby. Um, I'm actually currently driving right past Chicago right now for work. So, Hey, Andrew and Eric. So I'm going to be quick. I have a couple points that I'm going to talk fast as to not waste your time. I have been listening so long to you guys that I remember having to download QuickTime files on my computer, and it always <laughs> took a long time but was always worth it. Also, Andrew, you can get the Harry Potter books of Kindle Unlimited on your Kindle for free. I believe it's a part of Amazon Prime. You get to have rent ten books at a time. I always just have the seven Harry Potter books and then rotate the other three. Although it's probably too late. You already bought those, but you're really good at returning things, so you could try that. <laughs> also, here's my question for you guys. J.K. Rowling will probably never get back to me, but what do you think it means that my Patronus is a badger, I'm a Hufflepuff, and I was born in Wisconsin, Wisconsin, which the state animal is a badger? I think it's pretty cool. Also, you guys make me laugh more than any other podcast. The banter between you guys is the best, and I can't wait to be chosen to be co-host. Thanks for sending me an illustrated edition. Love you guys. Bye. Look at that voicemail. That was beautiful. Thank you, Abby. Are you um, going to choose her right now? I mean, <laughs> yeah, we're going to call her. We're going to add her anyway. right now. <laughs> I choose you. <laughs> um, I, it sounds like you're just a pure Hufflepuff through and through. Yeah. That all works out perfectly. I'm jealous. Yeah. As for Kindle Unlimited, yes, I'm aware of that. But Kindle Unlimited is like $10 a month, I think. Or no, no. She said it's part of Amazon Prime. Okay, so I have rented the Harry Potter books. But for some reason, I can only rent one at a time. Maybe Kindle Unlimited, which you pay for, yeah. lets you rent up to 10. And you can't use them on iPads. It can only be on Kindle devices themselves that you can access the rentals on. Uh, but that is a good point for anybody who's looking for a way to hold on to digital versions of the books. So then what would happen if you stopped subscribing? Would you, because they're rented, you wouldn't have them downloaded on your device. Like You don't own them? Yeah. That too, uh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. That just like Spotify or something. Micah? And one other thing just to add in there that the Hodag, Andrew, which you mentioned earlier, is indigenous to Wisconsin. I'm just oh, saying. That's cool. Who are you I, calling a Hodag, Micah? You. I love okay. Wisconsin. I was there last weekend. It's a great state. I got cheese curds. I hung out with locals, sort of. All right, some text messages too. Uh, first text message comes from Matt K. I think we had one from him last week, too, a former transcriber. Hey, MuggleCast, Matt K. from Winnipeg. I was re-watching Chamber of Secrets the other day and decided to look up the timeline of Tom Riddle on the HP lexicon and found this. Quote, Merope Gaunt arrives at the orphanage in the evening, destitute and near death. She had no will to live and has forsworn magic after being abandoned by her muggle husband, Tom Riddle, whom she had tricked into wedlock with a love potion. Do you think this will come into play at all with the idea of an Obscurus? Mm. So now that we know what an Obscurus is, we're seeing them everywhere in every corner <laughs> under every tabletop. Yeah. I mean, she's already an adult though. I, right. To me, it's it's all about children. Yeah. Well, it's about suppressing your natural magical ability. Morobi makes a conscious choice not to use magic because for her, magic represents more pain than it does happiness. Mm -hmm. The question is to whether or not an Obscurus develops or her magic tries to fight her back might be what results in her dying. I won't rule it out. I think it's sort of brilliant. 
yeah, it definitely probably contributes to her death. But well, because she could, she could. It definitely directly contributes because presumably she could use magic to heal herself. And you would think that as an adult, it's easier to control not being a witch or wizard, suppressing the right. magic. Like like Eric said, you're you're making a conscious decision. I don't want to do this. Yeah. Whereas as a child, you're more confused about your direction in life, I guess. So it might have to be like a, a formative thing, like in your development to mm. halt. Next one. Next one is from Jay. It says, hey, MuggleCast, I've been enjoying your insight into Harry Potter. However, my theory is for Fantastic Beasts and Jacob and how he could be helpful. He does seem to have a calming effect on all the characters. Could he be given objects that have been imbued with magic to protect himself and to attack whomever our quartet find themselves in battle with? Just a theory I had thought of for a squib character uh, in my own fan fiction. Thanks. Huh. So... One thing I was reminded of about this text message is when Newt decides to protect Jacob from the irrumpent by giving him, you know, a thin layer of armor. Yeah. Saying things like your skull is susceptible to whatever it is, damage from increased velocity. So in the future, if Newt, if Jacob is to accompany the Core Four to England and, and fight in some reasonable way in the war against Grindelwald, it does make sense that he would have some additional protections because the core four can't always be next to him, you know, fighting side by side. Presumably they'll get separated and he would kind of hold them back if they need to launch into like a wizard duel. So the idea that he is going to be given some kind of protective, maybe it's an amulet or maybe it's um, maybe he'll befriend a beast that can protect him. I think that's very natural for how how Jacob is going to survive for a while. Yeah. Or maybe, like, Dumbledore has something that'll protect Jacob. Like an invisibility cloak type thing. Take this and you will be safe against the wizards. Yeah. Or or maybe Newt, maybe uh, Nicholas Flamel will give him some elixir of life. Mm. For whenever he gets damaged. Yeah. I feel like it's less likely yeah. they'll give him anything to help him battle and it'll be more like a quick escape route. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Take a port key. Yeah. <laughs> Jump into the suitcase. All right, and to wrap up the show today, let's play some Quizage. Yay. So last week's question was as follows. What blemish does Hermione inflict upon Marietta Edgecombe for her misdeeds? And the answer to that specific question is that the word sneak appears on Marietta's forehead as if they're by, you know, like sort of pimples or there's there's just like a very visible word sneak. And Thinking about that, that was the answer, by the way. I'm reminded of that scene in in, in order and how just how violent, her, how violently Hermione responds to being betrayed because Marietta is unable to remove this, you know, and, and nobody's really able to remove this blemish from her. And I'm pretty sure she carries it with her for years to follow. Hmm. So, well, it's, it's just, yeah, Hermione does really good magic. Don't get on her bad side. Yeah. And this week's quizits question for all of us to ponder is uh, from Half Blood Prince. Oops, I gave it away. But <laughs> what is the first name of each of Severus Snape's parents? Okay. That's a good question. First, first names. Micah will find out as soon as the illustrated edition is released. <laughs> <laughs> hey, have you guys heard of this book, Half Blood Prince? Yeah, it's it's a great read. Good read. Great read. Dumbledore dies. Can't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> Nikki, it's been nice having you on the show today. Thank you of for joining us and for your support. It's been great being here. Good. I hope you had fun. Go play some Pokemon Go after this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> or Thank go you. listen to uh, some Dexas Midnight Runners. <laughs> That's a clue to the uh, question that Eric just asked. Oh. oh I was like, what? <laughs> yeah. I think oh, there's gosh. Yeah, that anyway. was way out there. But you're right. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I'm talking about, Eric? Yeah, what do you call a woman with one leg? Okay, no, yeah, I'm com yeah, okay. Yeah. completely out of this I'm confused. joke here. Yeah, yeah same. Okay. So thank you, everybody, for listening. We would love your support over on patreon.com slash mugglecast. You can listen to live streams as we record, typically on the weekends. We actually we, we have a new editor, and um, we're about to 
find out how long it's going to take to edit. So we may not have these episodes out every Monday. They may be a day or two later in the week. But, of course, we are still coming to you every week in in the best quality possible, the best sound quality possible. And your support helps us pay for professional editing. So thank you so much to all of you who support us. And we hope you enjoy the benefits over on patreon.com slash mugglecast. You can find more information just by going to our website, mugglecast.com. You'll also find our voicemail number there where you can call in. Make sure to call us while you're driving through Chicago. (laughs) Or if you've been listening since being in your mother's belly, give us a call. We'd love to hear your story. Um, We're also on facebook.com slash mugglecast and twitter.com slash mugglecast. Thanks, everyone, for listening. I'm Andrew. I'm Eric. I'm Micah. And I'm Nikki. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Bye.